moving on from that, thanks very much indeed for inviting me. I think this is a, a really important subject. Um, I just want to say that start off by saying China does pose a massive problem for uh, the nature of the of the free world, the liberal economies that uh, assume automatically, as George Osborne did back at the time of what then became uh, known in the government through the civil service as Project Kowtow, uh, when in actual fact his comment, I remember arguing with him about this, was that don't worry because in fact uh, opening up Chinese markets will of course lead to a significant liberalization of their uh, government and type of government and the way in which they operate with the rest of the world. I think the truth is we've seen almost exactly the opposite take place. And that's because I think we've misunderstood the nature of where, um, where China sees the rest of the world and itself uh, in a completely different term. I mean, the key problem here is that China does not see its form of government as anything else but the right form of government. The Chinese Communist Party <clears throat> believes that the rest of the free world has got it badly wrong and that the way to run uh, an economy and a government and uh, their type of system is through centralized and then disseminated control down at the very uh, every level. And in fact, since those early days when we were doing with it, the President Xi has made it very clear that he has tightened up that control rather than loosened it as the economy in China has grown significantly and Western economies have level best to pour as much money into China to produce products cheaper, but to buy into technologies and to share technologies. And this is the challenge that we face. The truth is the government of China is exactly what it says it is, a totalitarian dictatorial regime uh, that brooks no dissent at any stage and moves quickly to crush that dissent. We can see that throughout the whole of the way that China behaves internally. Uh, the Uyghurs are a big story at the moment. Uh, huge issues around whether or not what they're doing is genocide. Tibet is getting worse in the sense that half a million are now being moved into labor camps. But beyond that, you've got the treatment of the Christians, the Falun Gong, uh, and now I understand Inner Mongolia, uh, those living there are having their languages banned, and it's the start of the way that they moved on uh, the Uyghurs as well. So there's a pattern of behavior which is don't let uh, separate ethnic groups create division and divide you, and you have to do whatever it is to silence those and to dispense with that. And then externally, you know, China has accelerated its plans. The South China Seas is a fascinating land grab or sea grab as it were they had no historic links with that the un told them that but they've still stayed there and they built up these islands a huge problem for places like vietnam and the philippines obviously it's uh, it's a resource rich area and then you deal with their behavior to their neighbors in india on the border uh, and now of course they're finally abandoning of what they thought was the persuader for uh, uh, for Taiwan to come on board uh, with the uh, one country, two systems in Hong Kong. Exasperation finally with Hong Kong and its concept of <coughs> free speech has allowed them to trash uh, the Sino-British agreement and install their own uh, Chinese uh, security system uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, um, and many of those people that I have spoken to, many of them now under arrest and being shipped into China for what can be said to be less than a proper and fair trade. But beyond that, how do they behave in their market relationships with different countries? There's no question in my mind that what President Xi said early on that he intends to be the dominant economic power by 2049 and the correspondingly dominant military power is absolutely clearly what he wants to do. And they are well on track to do that. They break the rules wherever they feel like it in terms of the trading rules. And they also set out strategically and have managed successfully to corner key areas that they know the free world needs. Let's just look at uh, rare earth materials. They have cornered now about 80 to 85% of the world's production of rare earth materials. These go into the computers, the batteries, technology. They also have the world's largest production capability of bringing rare earth materials down to the level that they can be used with the West of the world charging over there to get these. Batteries, of course, are critical for this, and they also have the world's largest battery production process. You can see the local authorities in the UK now charging over there to stick into their buses, all those Chinese batteries. Uh, the Belt and Road Project is nothing short of extension of power through control economically, and the countries, particularly in the developed world, that they have lined up to use their money. But their money comes with a strong set of strings attached, which is, you get the loan, but you have to buy Chinese, so you buy it back. 
And anyway, in the UN, of course, the more of these countries that come onto Belt and Road, the fewer there are likely ever to vote against them in the UN when it comes to anything to do with their practices. So this is a strategic plan, the sort of plan that only really you could argue uh, that a communist dictatorial regime can actually make. It has tied in two things really importantly, and here I will end. It has tied in the desperate need for uh, the West to seek markets and to invest their money and to use their money to build those markets. So it knows that that money will flow to China almost regardless of how they behave. And the second thing is, instead of just taking that money and using it in any way, they use it strategically to build themselves, that middle kingdom, back to where they believe they should have always been by the last 250 years. So this is the problem we face. We are dealing with a country, not like any other country, small enough and manageable, this country is a dominant and growingly more dominant in the world, not just economically, but militarily. And the West needs to figure out that having fed this, when does it stop feeding it? And when does it start beginning to believe that this is, a, this is detrimental to world trade and to diplomacy and peace?